How's it guys? I'm MJ the Student Actuary and I'm here with uh, Mario who is also studying to become an actuary. Um, Mario, why don't you introduce yourself? Well, what do I say about myself? Do I start with my career background, Mike, or do you want me to give me a more eccentric introduction to myself or to perhaps introduce why I have this Yorkie sitting on my lap? It's, it's not a Yorkie, it's a Corgi. Sorry, a Corgi, my okay. bad. It's, it's, a, it's the best dog in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are, although, no, beagles are better. Hey, no, no, Corgis are better. Do you, well, you think so? Yeah. Okay, anyway, let's talk about well, actuarial no, science. We're having this discussion, you know, it's not actuarial <laughs> terms. Yeah, okay. Okay, let's, yeah, let's get past the dogs and let's mm. chat about... Um, so, you studied actuarial science like me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did actuarial science and I did a master's in math mathematics of finance. So you, let's talk about that and master's. I'm a PhD in mathematics of finance, believe it ooh, or not. Ooh, yes. So let's talk about the PhD. Tell me about your PhD. Oh, what are I'm you doing? PhD topic is a bit of a iffy kind of topic, you know. I mean... The aim of the PhD is you know, generally they expect the student to come up with a topic, but in the realm that I work in, in fact, the supervisor does provide the topic. So because of the, you know that, I mean, you've got the maths of finance and actuarial science background, um, they give me a topic that marries both of those fields, which is catastrophe bonds. So what those are, it's basically, a, it's a financial instrument, like a corporate bond, that an insurance company or any company that is, ex that is exposed to the risk of natural disasters occurring will issue. And um, so they will issue this, this instrument and what it is, it works like a bond. So they issue the instrument and they receive money from investors. And then this, the repayment of this money as will be contingent, as we like to say in our fancy CT5 terminology, on the occurrence of the, of the specified natural catastrophe in a simplest form. Variations of these um, instruments do exist because they are um, they're not standardized. You know, it's a fairly new market. There's no, they, and all the trading is done over the counter. So um, the repayment of the capital and the coupons of, of this instrument is contingent upon a catastrophe occurring. So should the catastrophe occur, either there will be a write down of the coupons or alternatively um, the, 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 the actual nominal amount that was paid will be written down in whole or in part depending on the severity of the cat catastrophe that, that in fact occurred. And then what the insurer can then do is they can use this capital that they received from the, from the, from the, from the bond issue in order to pay out those excess claims that result from that catastrophe. And it's very useful because it provides a source of capital up front for the, um, for the insurer. And it's useful because the catastrophe risks, they are very dependent types of risks and very difficult to predict. So when a catastrophe occurs, generally, if you think of in the case of a general insurer, a whole group, a whole bunch of policies is affected and not just a single policy. You know, which which makes the the they, they, they the, it violates the law of large numbers. In fact, so it's a useful source of funding for those types of events, and that's why there's been a lot of proliferation of these types of instruments being issued. So, is this like a an alternative form of risk transfer? Correct. So instead of sending the 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 instead of instead of transferring the risk to the reinsurer, you transfer it to the capital markets or to investors. And there's this big belief out there that the capital markets and the investors that they have more of the ability to to absorb these losses compared to the reinsurers. And I mean that makes perfect sense because the reinsurers is only a small number of them worldwide, and they're all very connected. You know, I mean, um, Munich is very well, some is is, um, is operates in a variety of different places, and so do Swiss, and so do um, um, what a January in that. So they're all very connected. Well, yeah, so, I mean, a lot of them are. Like yeah, you say. so chances are sometimes if one goes bust, another another one might also go bust. But they have very stringent capital requirements, so that might not necessarily happen. But remember also, there's the that reinsurers can reinsure with another reinsurer, so they are very well connected. So that's why insurers have been turning to these alternative forms of capital um, in, as provided by the, 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 the capital or the investment markets themselves, which are a very broad and diverse group of people that can provide funding. And strangely enough, the biggest investors in these catastrophe bonds are pension funds. Well, I guess the, because if I'm a pensioner, I mean, I'm sorry, if I'm a pension fund, if I invest in the bond market, the equity market, the property market, what I'm looking for is diversification. I don't want my investments to be correlated. And if I invest in a catastrophe bond, I mean, a tornado or a hurricane or a tsunami is no way correlated to the stock market. Well, exactly. You hit the nail on the head. That's precisely why they invest it. But just they invest in these things. And in 
I think I mentioned that they're the biggest investors in these things, and that's precisely why. But just bear in mind that they that they won't buy the entire bond. They buy into funds of these bonds, okay? And generally, they invest a small proportion of their own of their um their pot of money in um these catastrophe bonds. You know, it's not a big portion because I mean the risk is obviously huge on these catastrophe bonds. But I mean, obviously, another reason why people invest in these catastrophe bonds is because of the high returns. But also, as you correctly mentioned, is it no correlation with the financial market so it's of high use so how do you price a catastrophe bond well that's the difficulty because in order to price these bonds because remember what i said is that the the repayment of the you, you can take your standard bond valuation formula like an, an annuity so you've got the nominal amount that's paid in the coupons but remember now that the coupons the, the repayment of the coupons are condition on are contingent or conditional on the fact of a natural catastrophe not occurring in fact okay so the full coupon is paid and so you need a model that predicts the occurrence of the natural catastrophe over time and then that that becomes difficult because now you're trying to predict you're going into weather prediction and you're going but very far into the future so it's not just what the meteorolog meteorologists on the television do i mean it's what um i mean this is this is very complicated stuff and then you have to take the, you obviously have to take those values, those cash flow values then, multiply them by the probability or the chance of that, of that um, event of the catastrophe not occurring. And then you have to somehow discount those or bring those cash flows back to today's value. So that you can then get an, an approximate or a, an expected value of what the cash flows will be. Now, I mean, if to go into technical jargon, um, as you know, with options and that, um, these types of instruments are usually priced under a certain measure. So the measure basically speaks to what probability or what probability distribution am I going to attach to the occurrence or non-occurrence of that catastrophe in the future. And um, in, in options pricing, um, the, the most common measure used is the risk to neutral probability measure, as you know, with the Black-Scholes formula. Formula, but the problem with using the risk neutral measure is that the risk neutral measure only applies in the context of now let me just think and get this right in the context of the market being complete i.e. that every claim or every payment that occurs in the market is hedgeable so there are other instruments in the market that you can use to replicate the cash flows of the instrument that you're actually trying to price but unfortunately with these catastrophe bonds they aren't hedgeable well they aren't hedgeable yet no, they aren't hedgeable, finished and clock, because um, can you hedge, can you predict when the next cyclone is going to hit New Orleans? So you may not be able to predict when it is, but if you could find someone who is willing to make a bet on the weather. So you know, you have people who bet on sport and people who bet on who's going to be the next president elected. Mm -hmm. Can't you have people predicting on these disasters? So could you not make a market where someone says i predict there's going to be a tsunami in five years time and if there is they get a payout and then you can use that derivative or that option as a hedge or is that unreasonable and why well, just explain to me why are you then why are you taking sort of a complete reverse kind of so approach to doing this what guarantees that you're going to get someone who's going to i mean that, that that's precisely what the bond is doing that they are but it's basically, no, these people, basically investors are taking the bet on the fact that the catastrophe is not going to occur. So yes. you're saying that you're going to enter into an opposite hedge, basically, that you're going to introduce some instrument that um, the repayment is conditional upon the, the event yes, occurring. Yes, because think about it. So an insurance company reduces so who risk. who issue this instrument? Who would want to take a bet on that? That's a gambling. Gam a gambling house. So you have the one person, the insurance company, selling the catastrophe bond. And then you have a gambling house that does the exact opposite. Well, that could be a good point, you know, and it could speak to the use of utility functions. And that, but I'm not an economist, so I don't know to go into that economic theory. But you just opened up another new sort of can of worms, but an interesting one. In that, why aren't the gambling and insurance markets linked? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's probably, there's a lot. I mean, the, I mean, the casinos, I mean, I'm going to use it for lack of a better word, the casinos market. I mean, that's... That's massive. I mean, if you just have to think in Vegas alone, how much money flows there every day. Mm -hmm. I mean, now why is it? Why can't that be sort of used as an opposite hedge to um, to sort of insurance claims? Yeah, instead of but betting. But the reason why they, I mean, that obviously because I mean people are betting there on on completely different processes to so the processes that the insurers are betting on. Well, yeah. So people but if there, you could somehow sort of create a game or something, you know, whereby people bet on the occurrence of weather. Yes. But you see, the problem comes in is the short term mind of the gambler. 
Well, the, th- the problem with gambling at the moment is that if I walk into a casino, I know straight away that the odds are against me. I know that the house always wins when I'm playing the slots and when I play various card games. But if I go and I bet, say, on the weather, something like you said, that is very difficult to predict. And that gives me a chance to actually make money because if I'm smarter, so if I'm a meteorologist or one of the guys, you know, do the geography and all that type of stuff, I can then try beat the system and yeah, I can actually see, make and money. It's the whole fundamental idea of gambling because gambling, you, the way that I would understand it, is that you don't, um, when you gamble, mm-hmm. especially in a casino setting, you shouldn't be in a position that you have information such that you could potentially beat the casino. No, what, what do you think sport betting is? So you look at sport betting. So let's say I'm going to go bet on Man United, okay, and I develop a, a sports model that you know looks at Man United's previous 10 scores and uses that to you know create a time series that predicts how many goals they're going to score now. Mm-hmm. Um, remember what, what I did with the World Cup with odd actories. And we have a model like that that we believe to be superior to the bookies. So if you make a catastrophe model that is more superior to the insurance market or to the gambling house and you use that information advantage to profit from. But how would you make a model that is superior to the insurers or superior to the people actually pricing these catastrophe ones, you know, like the... Well, that's where our actuarial power and so actuarial you're innovation comes from. So you develop a superior model to model the weather. Yeah, and then we can almost enter in... Look, but then against, again, I guess there's the whole social thing. Do you want to profit from a natural disaster? You know, if there's an earthquake and everyone's devastated, do you want to just morally or ethically have made money from that situation? Well, personally, I wouldn't, but I mean, in the world that we live in nowadays, I mean, why not? You know, there are millions of moral injustice out of there going on at the moment, you know, and... I mean, we, we start with labeling examples. I don't want to go down that road, but there are, there are a lot in terms of people making money off other people's ignorances. And I mean, I think one of the clear examples is insurers playing off the asymmetry of information that exists between the insurer and the client, mm-hmm. trying to sell you a policy that you don't really need. You know, so, I mean, why not? You know, why not try? Yeah. But unfortunately, the thing is, me being in academia, you're very restricted, unfortunately, um, to the existing models and the existing theories that have put, been put forward by the great minds. is a, It's very difficult to sort of move on from that and sort of get the idea published in the journal unless you've actually got one of those great minds supporting you. So that's very difficult. But I mean, you know, I mean, open to these new ideas is, is definitely cool. So you're saying somehow develop a superior model to... But I mean, how would that work? I mean, Cause it doesn't I'd... solve the problem. Look, I don't want, to, don't want to have this video going for too long, so I just want to ask one more question. Mm-hmm. And this is just to tie it up, like, so if we could develop a superior model and all that type of stuff, because maybe some of the viewers here are interested in catastrophe models and have got an idea to model, you know, these natural disasters, is as an individual, can I access the catastrophe bonds? Can I purchase a catastrophe bond? Or is that market only open to the big players such as pension uh, pension funds and you know really big investors or is it open to the individuals like you and I look I'm not sure in the South African context and I'm just I'm not sure in general but I'll answer with what I do know and what I am aware of is that there are these catastrophe bond indices that are published by Swiss Re and Munich Re if I'm not mistaken and from what I believe is that they are sort of um there, there are funds that try and track the performance of these catastrophe indices or there are a couple of options or so that are, 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 are um, based on these catastrophe indices. And I know that um, a lot of your, um, a couple of your unit trusts and investment houses do actually purchase these types of instruments as well as your standard vanilla catastrophe bonds are um, as part of the holdings in their funds. So you as an investor can get indirect access to them. I don't think that you can get completely direct access. And you're not going to be able to get direct access to them anyway because they're just they're very, very, very large sums of money that are in the issue. You know, it's of the order of close to over, uh, I mean, at least $50 million plus. Sure. You know, and nobody is in their wildest dreams is going to invest the $50 million plus in a single investment, you know. 
That's why you get a whole pool of investors that comes in to read those high returns. Yeah, so it's my 50 cents. Okay, cool. Thanks for chatting with us, Mario. And yeah, I'm MJ, the student actuary. And let us know if you enjoyed this discussion, and we will make some more. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, oh, look, all you didn't enjoy it. Yeah. He didn't enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. Let's check him out. Cheers. <laughs>